Hey out there, all you history lovers. This is Mr. P of Mr. P's World History HQ with another awesome look into the world of the ancient Greeks, our distant cultural ancestors, and the forefathers of our modern day world. I'm going to begin by asking a question with a totally obvious answer. How many of you love to be entertained? I'm guessing everyone, right? Right. We love to spend our free time being entertained through movies, television, books, video games, and a whole mess of other media. It's how we relax, and sometimes use our imaginations to let go of the busy day we just had. Well, our friends the Greeks were no different. They loved to laugh, hear jokes, the weirder the better, listen to music, and see stories laid out before them just as we do. Of course, they didn't have all the technology and methods to be entertained that we take for granted now. No, if they wanted to have all that, they had to go out and see a play. And there were all kinds of them, from all the records and examples that have been passed down over thousands of years. But even those plays weren't quite what we're used to today. Greek plays were performed in giant, semi-circular, open-air theaters called theatron, which are sometimes called amphitheaters, that were set into hillsides around the Greek city-states. They could fit hundreds of spectators, and as you can see by looking at the photos, they look exactly like our movie theaters and stadiums today, or close. Many of those giant amphitheaters still exist in the Mediterranean Sea area, and some, thousands of years old, are still used by modern performers. And though it sounds strange to our modern ears, as best as we can tell, only men could attend these plays. Sorry ladies, I know it's unfair. It was a guy's kinda only thing, at least in the early days. It changes later on though, I promise. So what were these plays like? Greek plays were a lot less like our modern plays and were more like an opera. The parts were mostly sung. There were musicians who played flute-like instruments and drummers who banged out rhythms. Actors were all male and wore different types of painted clay masks to become different characters, including the parts of women. Yes, that's right, even for the romance scenes. And there was a group of narrators people who sang the background information to give the spectators watching the ongoing story called the chorus. The chorus would also dance as they sung out the story. This was all acted out in an area of the amphitheater called the orchestra, or dancing floor. It sounds weird to us, but in the earliest Greek plays, there was only one actor who would play out different parts while the chorus sang the plot to the story. The actor would disappear every so often into a small tent behind the stage called a skein to change into different costumes and masks. Later on in history, going to the skein marked the beginning of a new part of the play. This is where we get the word scene from to separate parts out of a modern day play. Most early Greek plays were called tragedies. Tragedies depicted the downfall of a noble hero or heroine, usually through some combination of hubris that's when a person thought that they didn't have to follow the rules, fate and the will of the gods. Usually these plays were stories told to show how humans could fall down and then get back up again to achieve their goals after learning an important lesson. Tragedies were all about rights and wrongs. Sometimes the characters died as a result of their behavior and sometimes they only went through some bad times to teach them that they weren't as good as they thought they were. Bad stuff happened, period. These weren't happy ending type situations, usually. However, as serious as these plays could be, no violence was permitted to be shown on the stage, and the death of a character had to be heard from off stage and not seen. This managed to cause suspense for the crowd and forced you to use your imagination as to what was going on. Quite a bit different than what we're used to seeing in our own favorite shows and movies today. Later on, there would be as many as three actors in each play, each playing multiple characters all male, and all in masks. There would also be extra, non-speaking actors who might be in the background. There were several great playwrights in ancient Greece that specialized in tragedies. There was Aeschylus, who loved to squeeze as much drama into every play he wrote, and invented the idea of the sequel. Sophocles, who added the third actor into his plays and was the guy who began using painted scenery in all of his productions, and Euripides, who liked to shock his audiences and make them think using awkward subjects, funny but realistic dialogue, and beautiful lyrics for his chorus to sing to get the crowd's attention. These three were the first greats of Greek drama, and many of their plays were borrowed and translated by the Romans centuries later. Some of these plays, those that survived over time, are still put on by special groups of actors today. Some of the most famous tragedies are also a part of Greek mythology. The Iliad, which dealt with the Trojan War and its sequel, the Odyssey, 
which tells the tale of a lost sailor king named Odysseus, or two tragedies written by the famous Greek playwright Homer. And as if tragedies weren't enough, all of this would someday evolve into a new type of Greek play called the comedy, which as you might have already guessed is all about the laughs. This type of play had far less rules attached. Politicians could be poked fun at, gods could be discussed in amusing ways, and the Greek playwrights sort of let their hair down, so to speak, when it came to what could be said and done in their creations. The plot or story of comedies usually stretches reality in terms of time and space, jumping incredible geographic distances and rapidly changing scenes. Fantastical elements such as giant creatures and improbable disguises are mixed with references to the audience, which delivers a roller coaster ride of satire, parody, puns, exaggeration, colorful language, and rude, crude jokes. As the plays were popular entertainment, they reveal some of the popular language used by the Greeks, language not usually found in more serious written material. Think slang. Any public figure was fair game, so if you were unpopular as a politician, you might not like what you'd hear in some of the plays written with you in mind. Even mythology and religion could be made fun of. However, despite this high degree of free speech, certain aspects of religion, like more important gods such as Zeus and Athena, seem to have been off limits for the comic poet. Still, it opened up a lot of opportunity for people to get their jollies compared to the often sad and depressing tragedies. Over the centuries, many of these Greek plays would get passed on to the Romans, who also added their own twists and ideas, and from there onto the Middle Ages and Renaissance, where they evolved gradually into the full-blown plays you might go out and see today, with dozens of actors, beautifully designed sets, special effects, and even entire orchestras playing music during scenes. When movies were invented, much of what had been learned over the many years since the ancient Greeks kicked it all off were incorporated into filmmaking. And today we have CGI-infused blockbuster action movies that would have blown the average Greek's mind inside out if he or she would have seen them. So that gives you a little bit of background on how the ancient Greeks put on their entertainment for the masses. Check out some of the links below for some examples of Greek plays in action in modern day. Hopefully you enjoyed the show, and above all, learned a little something about the everyday lives of the ancient Greeks, who were kicking things out millennium before anyone had ever even thought of us. If you're an educator listening to this, feel free to use this video for your own classes. And on a side note, if you really dig mythology, legends, and other supernatural weirdness, feel free to subscribe to this channel for more, or come visit my other project, Mr. P's Mythopedia, with the links provided below. Hope you enjoyed the discussion, thanks for the viewership and support, and we'll see you again real soon with another wild adventure in ancient legendary awesomeness.